Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for coming. My name is uh, Colonel Marty O'Donnell. I'm the Public Affairs Director for U.S. Army North. Had the pleasure of meeting some of you a few weeks ago at uh, Camp Atterbury's Media Day. Thank you for, uh, for coming here uh, today. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, the list of speakers uh, for today. You'll be hearing from seven speakers. I'll be coming back to the podium to uh, just to uh, in between each speaker to reintroduce uh, them. But I'll go through the, uh, the list right now. So the first speaker you'll hear from is Mr. Mr. Aaron Batt. Uh, he is the Department of Homeland Security Lead Federal Coordinator uh, for Camp Atterbury and the Operation Allies Welcome Mission here. Uh, next, you'll hear from Colonel Mike Grunman, uh, who is the Installation Commander uh, here at Camp Atterbury. Uh, third, you'll hear from Mr. Cole Varga, who is the Executive Director of Exodus, uh, one of the resettlement agencies here in the state of Indiana. Uh, fourth, you'll hear from uh, Nahid Sharifi. She is a uh, Afghan guest here and will soon uh, resettle here in the state of Indiana. Uh, fifth, you'll hear from Ambassador Christine Elder, the State Department lead uh, for the Operation Allies Welcome uh, mission here. Uh, six, you'll hear from Mr. Fred Payne, uh, who is the State of Indiana Commissioner for Workforce Development. And last, uh, but certainly not least, you will hear from the Governor uh, um, of Indiana, uh, Eric Holcomb. Uh, his uh, time uh, is limited uh, here. He's got a tight uh, timeline. He, he will remain at the podium. We'll try to get to maybe one, maybe two questions uh, at that time. He will then move on, and then I'll come back to the podium and facilitate questions and answers with all the others. Any questions about, about that? Okay, uh, before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Bat, since it is the holiday season, uh, I just want to offer my thanks. Thanksgiving is coming up this week. Thank you to the state of Indiana, uh, to all the partners here uh, for obviously coming together uh, for Operation Allies Welcome. You'll hear about uh, the passion, I think, from all the speakers uh, here today, and I'm really just so thankful uh, that everyone is here and for the support of the state. With that, Mr. Aaron Bat. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Governor, uh, for coming out here, and uh, of course, our distinguished guests. Uh, as Colonel O'Donnell mentioned, my name is Aaron Bat. I am the Department of Homeland Security uh, Lead Federal Coordinator uh, here at Camp Atterbury for Operation Allies Welcome. Today, I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking a little bit about um, you know, what has transpired since uh, maybe uh, some of you were out here uh, about a month and a half ago uh, for a media day. Uh, let you know where we are uh, with Operation Allies Welcome uh, from a, a national perspective and then of course uh, what specific uh, here in Indiana. So first I want to let you know that uh, we have welcomed in about 82,000 uh, Afghan evacuees, uh, some of those which included uh, U.S. citizens, um, uh, also uh, lawful permanent residents um, into uh, the United States. Um, so 82,000 as of today. Um, here at Camp Atterbury, uh, we have welcomed in about 7,200 uh, Afghan evacuees uh, since uh, the beginning, which started on 1 September. Uh, I think as some of you uh, might have already uh, heard, uh, we have, um, you know, uh, began welcoming in on 1 September. Uh, and by 7 September, uh, we had doubled uh, the city's uh, population size. At the national level, uh, over 30,000 uh, Afghan uh, evacuees have uh, resettled into communities. About 23,000 of those um, were through resettlement agencies. And uh, you'll hear a little bit about uh, the resettlement uh, agencies and what that means. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, the uh, 7,000 others uh, had resettled uh, in with their family through um, yeah, the, the, the community um, and the support systems that they already had here in place. I wanted to take a few minutes to just give an update on um, our resettlement uh, agencies here. Uh, there are nine uh, resettlement agencies across the United States. They have about 200 affiliates uh, associated with those resettlement agencies. Uh, I want to recognize the five uh, resettlement uh, affiliates that we have here uh, in Indiana. That includes Exodus, Catholic Charities of Fort Wayne and South Bend, Catholic Charities Indianapolis, Welcome Network, and most recently, uh, the Bernese American Community Institute. 
Today, we're also going to talk about uh, the Circle Sponsor uh, Program. Uh, this is a, a new initiative uh, that supplements uh, what our uh, resettlement agencies uh, are um, doing with uh, resettling, and it gives Hoosiers an opportunity uh, to also sponsor uh, uh, Afghan evacuees and families. One of the things that I'm probably uh, most proud of and unique specifically uh, to here at Camp Atterbury is our ability to stand up uh, four different centers. Um, some of those uh, uh, have been done at other locations, but one specific uh, to Indiana here uh, and that I think is unique is the Work Readiness Center. Uh, and so I want to thank the governor uh, and Commissioner Payne uh, for uh, standing that up. Really, it sets the stage for our um, Afghan evacuees when they get into uh, their communities. Uh, they'll already uh, you know, be able to hit the ground running uh, with employment. And so uh, he'll speak a little bit more uh, today. And then lastly, I just want to continue to thank uh, the Hoosiers uh, for their generosity, hospitality. Um, the number of donated um, goods and hours is um, uh, amazing. Uh, this week, uh, we took um, delivery of 26 pallets from Toys for Tots. And that included 13,000 pounds of toys and over 15,000 um, different toys. Toys. Um, and so we're working, of course, to distribute those uh, here at Camp Atterbury, but we're also working uh, to see how we can distribute those uh, to the resettlement agencies and our um, uh, guests who have already departed. And so with that, I'll look forward to uh, your questions uh, here in a few minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Colonel Mike Grumman, uh, Installation Commander here at Camp Atterbury. Thank you, Marty. Hi, my name is uh, Colonel Mike Grunman, uh, the installation commander. Uh, I'm a, a full-time National Guardsman and representing the Department of Defense here today. Camp Atterbury was uh, notified as being one of the eight safe havens uh, in mid-August. Uh, since that time, uh, we have surged uh, nearly 1,300 Department of Defense personnel from the Indian National Guard, the Oregon National Guard, the, the regular Army, the Navy and the Coast Guard here to help support our guests. Um, it has been a fantastic team effort, uh, along with our interagency partners and our non-government organizations to help uh, transition our Afghan guests from a, a pretty chaotic situation to one where they have some hope for the future. I continue to be exceptionally proud uh, of the support that the installation staff and the state has provided to this operation. For nearly three months now, we provided the basic logistical support, housing, food services, security for our Afghan guests. Uh, and, and while that's important, it's, it's also important to note that the DOD uh, and, and the National Guard is but a small cog in this wheel and not the lead agency. We remain focused on fostering a positive culture and environment for, for our guests and, and continue to work to resettle them as quickly as possible. Uh, to date, of the nearly approximately 7,200 Afghans who transitioned through here, 4,100 still remain, uh, and we're, we're looking to continue to, to double down our efforts and find them a good home in the United States. I'm especially grateful to the whole of community approach to this whole of government effort. Indiana, its communities, its individuals, its organizations, and the state government has been absolutely terrific uh, to maintaining a, a even flow of, of donated gifts, goods, services, uh, volunteers, linguists, dentists, uh, phrase books for American soldiers. It has been a truly incredible outpouring from, from communities and organizations alike, and I cannot stress that enough. Many of the donations that we received um, came through a system that Governor Holcomb set up through the uh, uh, National Guard armories uh, throughout the, the state. Uh, the Department of Corrections has helped to, to sort those goods. The Department of Transportation has helped to deliver them here. And to date, Camp Atterbury uh, has, has distributed almost 75% of the national uh, don donated items of the eight safe havens nationwide. Operations Allies Welcome has been a great opportunity for those who served in Afghanistan uh, to give back and make this transition to new American citizens uh, easier and as seamless as possible. I look forward to your questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Cole Varga, uh, Executive Director of Exodus.
Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here and, and see all the amazing work that's happening at, at Camp Atterbury and all the preparation to get our, our Afghan, our new Afghan neighbors ready for uh, permanent resettlement, which is what I've been asked to share a little bit of information about how, how resettlement works uh, in, the, in the time frame after people leave these eight bases. Um, so uh, I'll speak on behalf of Exodus, but largely true for many of the other partners that do this resettlement work across the 200 or so agencies in 49 states that resettle. Uh, we can be, think about resettlement in, in basically four phases, the first being the pre-arrival phase, where we're doing a lot of the preparatory work for families that will be coming to us. So that means setting up housing that's affordable and sustainable for new families, uh, stocking those apartments or rental homes with furniture and food donated from generous individuals across the community. Um, getting documents and, and things prepped and ready and applications for uh, the Division of Family Resources all set uh, and ready to go for the new families when they come. The second phase uh, is, is a 90-day period starting from the moment arrivals hit the airport uh, and extending for those 90 days uh, through a partnership with the, the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration. So these 90 days is really where the action happens. So that's getting them from the airport, introducing them, and, and walking them through their new apartment, uh, doing a safety orientation. What's a smoke detector? What's this garbage disposal thing? Uh, kind of getting them prepared and, and ready to understand where they're going to live and, and live safely. Uh, and then starts sort of an onslaught of the many, many appointments that need to happen to, to make sure that our, our new neighbors are, are taken care of and, and connected to resources. So that means uh, a health screening with the local health departments, uh, enrollment in uh, the children's local school and a, a tour of the school so the parents know where they're going all day. Um, getting people through Social Security, getting people through uh, family resources with the state of Indiana, um, and then starting English classes. We offer those four days a week uh, at Exodus. Many other agencies offer uh, similar structured English classes. Right now on Zoom, just to be safe. Um, we're preparing people for uh, how to budget finances in the U.S., how to prepare themselves for employment, uh, get ready for the job that will come that will help lead them to self-sufficiency, which in fact is the third phase of resettlement. So getting people uh, the knowledge and tools to not only get a job but to keep it. So that can mean uh, helping them set up with child care, uh, unlocking that battle, um, helping people uh, get to work on transportation, whether that be through public transportations. Uh, for us in Indianapolis, that's a, a great partnership with Indigo, or through uh, carpooling with other members that are already in the community that have been here a bit longer and, and have saved up to buy a car. So unlocking all of those, uh, those challenging barriers to make sure people can, can get a job, uh, a, a good paying job that will meet their expenses and uh, hold on to that job for, for the family. Uh, and then fourth uh, phase is sort of the longer term needs that can happen. And not everyone needs these services. Some may come, they'll have a job. They, some of our guests here um, at Atterbury speak quite a bit of English and, and may be very successful and have uh, college degrees and other work histories. And some may not, and that's okay. And that's why we'll stick around and, and help them with what they need, whether that's ongoing employment support, whether that's helping single parents uh, figure out childcare. Uh, whether that's uh, mental health needs. We have free mental health services we offer through our office, for example. We have women's and youth program services that we offer for just specific needs that, uh, that women may need or that youth may need coming into a new city, maybe not speaking English and being thrown into school. They might need a few extra supports, so we try to set them up with mentors or, or volunteers to help them adjust to, to their new life in the U.S. Um, so those are sort of the main four phases. Uh, like I said, it could be six months with some, it could be five years with other, and we'll, we'll be there all along the way if people need to come back and, and ask us for help. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is just how the, the funding mechanism works for resettlement, uh, both refugee resettlement in general and uh, Afghan-specific resettlement. Uh, the State Department actually funds about $1,225 per individual. Uh, that comes with people to our agency ahead of time to be spent on their behalf. So we're paying for security deposit. We're paying for the first couple months of rent. We're paying for um, electric bills, 
um, internet, which is so crucial nowadays to unlocking jobs in English classes, like I mentioned. So uh, that initial grant helps push people forward in those initial months. It takes a lot more resources than that. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement also step in with some supplemental funding for employment. Uh, some of that offered through the state of Indiana in partnership with FSSA. Uh, as well as incredible generosity from, from Hoosiers across the state who have really stepped up in this moment to donate funds, to donate diapers, to donate couches, um, winter coats and hats, all the things that, that these new families are going to need as they adjust to, well, now winter in Indiana, right? So uh, I'm incredibly thankful of the work being done here, incredibly thankful for the governor's support for our, for our work and our ongoing mission to uh, resettle refugees. So. Thank you all. Next, we'll hear from uh, Nahid Sharifi, who will resettle here in the state of Indiana. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Nahid Sharifi. I'm very happy that you give it this chance. I'm talking about myself and talk about my story. Actually, I came in fifth of the, I came to the United States in the fifth of the September, and my journey was long and scary. When I left Afghanistan, I separated from my mother and my brother and sister, and in Germany, I got separated from my sister and her family. My mother and brother didn't get it out of the Afghanistan because they got separated at the gate the day the bomb exploded, blast there. I was terrified where they were until I hear from, they, from them three days. It's okay. We got time. Take the time. Sorry. after I arrived in the Washington, D.C. It was the first time that I could first find a wife and have a contact with them. My husband was presidential employee in Afghanistan, and also he left the country in 2020. I'm very excited that I started my new life in the Indiana, and where I hope that to continue my study in Bloomington University. I have a message to the people of the United States, and I want to say that people of the United States has a heart of the gold. Thank you so much for everything. I'm sure that in different and in difficult condition, they never leave Afghan people alone. I'm sure that since I came to the other brick camp, I learned many things from them especially from the army, especially from the Department of State, you know that they behave very patiently and justly with Afghan people. And we learn many things of them. Thank you so much for everything. And I hope that I can make the world around me a better place for others like them. Thank you so much. As you can see, it's a deeply personal uh, and emotional uh, story, uh, not only uh, for Nahid Tashakor Manana uh, for sharing that, uh, but also for all of, all of the others here that are supporting the mission. And I think you'll, you'll hear from that from the, uh, the ambassador. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ambassador uh, Christine Elder uh, from the Department of State. Thank you, and thank you for your inspiring story. I want to just pick up for a second on your reference to Hearts of Gold here in Indiana and across the United States. Um, a number of my colleagues in Washington have been working on this issue since the, the middle of August when Kabul fell, and a number of my colleagues have gone to all of the safe havens to support the operations and to see what's going on. And increasingly, I'm hearing from those who've seen other, other bases, other safe havens, and especially those who've come here, are referring to Indiana as the gold standard. So I think it's the gold standard in hearts of gold. And it's that combination um, that gives us hope 
and gives us inspiration. So thank you for that, and thank you, Governor, uh, for being here today. And it's an honor to be here and to have a chance to highlight that work and that engagement across the state and at the community level. That's, you know, this is the first step and a hard step to get out, but this is the hard work, is to get integrated into the communities and to, to march forward on your new, a new, new journey. So what's happening here first at Camp Atterbury and in increasing numbers across the state as those numbers grow due to the hard work of Exodus and the other uh, resettlement agencies who are here today, represented here today. Um, it's incredible work, it's unprecedented work, both in scale and in number of what's happening. And you heard about the work of the resettlement agencies, the broad variety of what they've got to do uh, to help people get on their feet here and to start their new, their new journey. And even though in the state of Indiana, they've doubled the commitment of the number of Afghan families that they would host here and integrate, it's still not enough nationwide. The demand is higher than the capacity of resettlement agencies to do this. And we have seen with this heart of gold in Indiana, I think they filled every warehouse in the state of Indiana with donated items to help on this new path forward when you get resettled. But there is a desire to do more. And we've seen this day in and day out, both from, for instance, veterans who worked side by side with Afghans who they know by name and they know where they are in the United States, which of the safe havens, here and elsewhere. And the State Department was responding to a need that we can augment and support the work of the resettlement agencies with some of these programs, but people need a little bit of structure uh, to be able to do that in a way. It's very technical work. It's a long list of things that you've got to do to help people to resettle. But there's a program now that the State Department is supporting, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is also supporting this to give some structure to those who want to come together in small circles, in some cases to support specific individuals, uh, but it's open, a group of at least five people can get together, and this can be of a part of a community, or it can be organizations as well. And I would I would encourage you to, to take a look at the website. It's called the Sponsor Circle Program. And it really can give um, both a uh, training for people, it can give a foundation, it can give support, so that you can help them. It largely mirrors the work of the resettlement agencies, and therefore expands the capacity um, to resettle across, across the country and help meet that need and get more people on their way as soon as is, is possible. Um, what, what happens in this then is a group of at least five people, and you've got people with different ways that they can support and donate. Uh, some it's with their time, uh, and some it's with other ways, and they've got other areas of, of expertise. And they, you can apply as a group, and again, there are people who will help walk through the process, supply templates, explain, give training online, so that you do it in a structured um, and effective and efficient way. So, uh, you know, these first three months are critical, and really there are very specific things that need to happen during that time. But there's a, a, a large time commitment. This is not a light commitment. It's a commitment of time. It's a commitment of money. And it's a commitment of, 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 your, of your heart to do it. But it's a very rewarding experience. So please take a look at sponsorcircles.org. In addition to that, I would say um, if you want to engage and participate, um, look for the resettlement agency closest to where you live um, and reach out to them with your ability to support. And then the third uh, place I would highlight for you is called welcome.us, and it's a way people all over the country can engage and support in the way that fits them um, really, really best. So again, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be a part of this effort, and thank you to the state of Indiana. You're the gold standard. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Uh, for those of you uh, uh, in attendance from the media, those websites and more information about them were provided in the read ahead that you received uh, prior to it. Uh, now I'd like to call uh, Mr. Fred Payne, who is the Commissioner of Workforce Development here for the state of Indiana.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for that heartwarming uh, story. Uh, the essence of what we're all hearing here today uh, really boils down to a few things. Uh, housing, employment, health, transportation, and schooling for children. But what's really critical in that puzzle is employment. It's jobs and it's meaningful work. Because we know that at the core of our society, at the core of a strong family unit and a strong community, is self-sufficiency and a job and meaningful work. Now, I have the privilege here today to talk about some things that we're doing at the Department of Workforce Development here uh, at Atterbury. First, I want to talk a little bit about our team. Our team has been deployed here, and we have professionals who have been connecting people to jobs and employers. We're embedded in communities all around the state. So what's happening here at Atterbury, quite frankly, is an extension of what's happened uh, throughout Indiana. Now, recently, we mobilized a set of workforce professionals down here uh, at Atterbury, and we've provided some services, many of which are tailored to the needs of the people here at Atterbury. So what am I talking about? Let's look at this big picture, right? The big picture here is that we're giving the guest an overview of what it is to work in the United States. Now, the types of jobs and the types of industries and opportunities that exist, that's what we're trying to expose them to. We're even talking about topics such as taxes, cultural expectations in the workplace. We want to make sure that the information and the time that we're spending with our guests will serve them well, regardless of where they are. Now, we're doing a lot of this with our partners from the U.S. Chamber. But I want to give a special thanks right now to the Indiana National Guard. A lot of this is possible because the Indiana National Guard has been on the ground and is providing daily support. So I thank you to the Indiana National Guard. Now, at this particular uh, work, ready, work readiness center here, we've deployed a team of workforce experts who are on the ground, they're meeting with people individually and they're meeting with them in groups. And they're talking to them and they are also assessing the type of work that our guests have previously done, the skills they have, and even the skills they want to develop. Now we're looking at how their experience might be applied to jobs and industries uh, here in Indiana and beyond. We've developed a curriculum and training specifically for the needs of the guests here. We've translated materials into two different languages, Dari and Pashto. Now, we've also included on some of the materials uh, images to make them a little bit more easy to understand. We have interpreters on site to help to aid in conversation and understanding. Now, the folks that we're engaged with here uh, with our guest, it's a diverse group. Their experiences and skills are pretty broad. Our team of workforce professionals have engaged with doctors and astrophysicists, a chief financial officer, but there are a lot of people who haven't had those types of work experiences, and they need a few more basic needs, some basic assistance. They need help with speaking English, and or learning computers and preparing resumes and really preparing for a job interview. A lot of this happens when our folks engage with them on a one-on-one -on -one level. We're trying to make sure that we're providing personalized services to each and every guest who wants that experience. Now, for those individuals who've indicated that they have an interest in staying in Indiana, we've taken a step further, obviously working with our resettlement agencies we're connecting them to employers uh, in the communities where they plan to settle. We've engaged with over 150 employers who have told us collectively that there are about 4,000 open job positions in these communities. So how are we doing this connecting? We're doing anything from hosting virtual job fairs and making introductions to training and skilling people up for the specific roles that the employers have available to them. Now, we're really trying to ensure that we're doing every single thing that we can to set the people and the employers up for success. 
Now, our support doesn't end when a person resettles in a community. We want to make sure that we are providing them with ongoing and continuous support. This is the type of work that our agency does every day. We want to make sure that we're connecting people to jobs and we're connecting employers to people. Now, in closing, coming together to help one another, whether you're born in Indiana, you've lived here all of your life, or whether you've been displaced from work and you find yourself in Indiana now, our responsibility is to you. Our responsibility is to you as a community and as a state. But also, it's our pleasure. You've heard about this gold standard that someone spoke of earlier, but really the Hoosier hospitality is our pleasure. So thank you very much for allowing me to share information about what uh, our workforce development system is doing here at Atterbury. Uh, finally, it's my sincere honor and pleasure uh, to introduce the governor of the great state of Indiana, Governor Eric Holcomb. Governor. Thank you, uh, Colonel O'Donnell. Um, first, probably ought to start out by saying you probably need to own that phrase, uh, Indiana heart of gold. And I don't, I don't uh, know if it would hurt or help, but feel free to put the governor of the state of Indiana on your application to Indiana University uh, because they will be much better off with you on their campus. And uh, Cole, thank you uh, for, as I was coming in, there's a heart, this sums it up as well, a heart on the state of Indiana. I think we're all singing from the same sheet of music and certainly um, getting this latest update, this latest briefing, you heard what the ambassador and I heard as well. There's so much pride and passion and a reminder of, I think, all of our purpose while we're here uh, to help one another, to help our neighbors. As far away from where they come from, they're here at home in Indiana and in this country. And so it is an extremely appropriate time to share a lot of thanks to a, a lot of folks who have come from all over the state, all over the country, all over the world. I want to start with General, our adjutant general, General Lyles, uh, a, Sa a Salem, Indiana boy done good. Um, and also from those very first phone calls, with the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, getting a lot of questions answered before we all assembled. It's really been General Lyles who has made sure that we've had all the resources that we need to be well conducted, to be well organized, to be able to, to accommodate, to put all these pieces of this very complex puzzle together so it can help develop that picture and actually develop lives. Thank you, General Lyles. Thank you, Aaron, who is also a Salem, Indiana boy done good, which means they're probably related and they didn't know it. Um, this is how small the world is. These stories of how people come in to help, to come into an unprecedented endeavor from different walks of life. And to see these two work together on a very daily basis and to have Colonel Grunman of Vincennes, Indiana boy done good, come together and make sure that we're not only delivering what we have told our federal partners we can, but trying to I'm glad you mentioned the gold standard, but try, trying to be the gold standard. I mean, I hope it wasn't lost on anyone um, when Colonel Grunman shared that of all the donations 
throughout the, noon, throughout the nation coming into eight safe havens. I don't care how you count it. 75% is a big statement of who we are, making sure that what is needed on, at this camp, at this safe haven, diapers, shoes, clothing, toys to bring joy, is there in abundance. That doesn't just happen. That, that is coming from inside. That is coming from who we are. When I think about all the different state agencies, seeing Pam way in the background here, our state's epidemiologist and FSSA and Steve Cox with our state homeland security, all these pieces of the puzzle, making sure we're synchronized on carrying out smartly the plan of the day, every day, month after month after month after month, making sure folks not just have hope, but they have, as Ambassador Elder said, this blueprint or this pathway on their journey to peace and security and happiness. And so it is, it is really to, for me to be able to be with the team that was assembled earlier and just hear of the success stories on a day in, day out basis, to hear that there are, as Commissioner Payne said, jobs waiting, eager aspirants to fill those jobs in these various communities throughout not just the country, but Hammond and Muncie and Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, and Bloomington, all over our state. This is a good thing. This is a win-win scenario from whatever perspective you have. And I just, Cole, you representing the other um, resettlement agencies, you are doing the Lord's work. And you've, you've been doing it for a long time, but I think you were made for this moment. This is, we have never on Hoosier soil carried out something of this size and scope. And because the rubber meets the road where you're at, no matter what community in the state of Indiana, this just fuels our confidence, not in an arrogant way, but in a productive way for Nahid and her family and 7,200 of our guests who will become residents. Can't, the, the smiles that we saw on that tour, the hope from, from where they came, off balance, off a plane, missing luggage, dealing with health issues, the constant chaos, the spectrum from chaos to calm that 7,200 of our now neighbors, that journey in and of itself, that peace is priceless. And it fuels us to want to do more. And so, Ambassador, when, when we're reaching out to the state, to the Department of State, and, and asking for more resources and to Homeland Security, knowing that we're going to have the resources to succeed, um, it just doesn't get any better than that. And so I, 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 could, I wrote down a lot of notes in this, in this briefing. I don't think I stopped. But let me just, I, I mentioned to Colonel Grunman I too have, we're not related, but I too have family that from Vincennes. At least I don't think we are. I don't know how deep in the soil those roots get tangled, but I mentioned that in Vincennes, Indiana, there's a, one of the biggest monuments outside of Washington, D.C., and on it, carved in stone, is from another famous colonel that traipsed around these parts, Colonel George Rogers Clark. And at a, at a moment in our history, uh, 
where, where folks were carving out their futures. And on that monument is carved great things can be affected by men and women well conducted. And being well conducted is on full display right here. So with that, I just I wish everyone, no matter where you have come from, how long you are staying, a very happy Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for, including 7,200 uh, guests who will now become our American neighbors. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Don't care how tight my schedule is. Yes, sir. Well, first and foremost, we are very lucky. If you're from this country, we are very fortunate to have been born here. We're thankful that our ancestors made their way here, as mine did in the 1800s, from far away. I'm the beneficiary of their courage. And so first I would start there, that we have so much to be thankful for where we started out in life. I would also ask for people around the table, as will I, uh, to pray for, if so inclined, to pray for not just our new neighbors, but for their families who are still far away, separated. That are waking up every day hoping to be reunited. And we can do more. We're proving that here. This is, this is proof positive that when people from all walks come together, what good can come out of it? And I would just ask that um, folks keep in mind, not just who are with us now, but their families as, as well. And then finally, whether it's Homeland Security, FSSA, the, the Indiana National Guard, the Department of Health. Keep them in your thoughts, too. They've been going, you know, we talked about September 1st, uh, being in receipt of the call and standing up and mobilizing and um, getting the thumbs up go time. They've been going nonstop, but, but these folks have been going nonstop for, 24-7, seven, seven days a week for going on two years now with multiple balls in the air that have life implications. And they keep coming back to work just to try to help someone else out. And so I'd ask you to keep them in their thoughts and prayers too. Well, I, I, I hope that we're an example. Gold standard's great, by the way. Let's not screw that up. Um, I, I hope that, um, I hope we're an example of, of a place that comes together in times of great need and shared responsibility. And this is a joint effort, make no mistake about it. Local, state, federal, I should have included the local community. Um, the number of examples that I've received, second or third hand, about people who have come up to folks in uniform and said, no, I'm going to buy your lunch or I'm going to buy your coffee or thank you for what you're doing down there. The number of folks that say, How, where do I give? We'll hire everyone that wants a job. The, some of these organizations, you heard from Cole, have just said, I'll hire 50, I'll hire 100, I'll hire how many you got. We'll figure it out. Don't speak English, we'll figure that out. 
I hope we're an example of a state that figures it out. Well, you get two different answers from two different people. I'll speak for myself. Um, so I'm going to defer to the Department of Defense and Homeland Security and the Department of State, and we're here to assist them. And so they'll, they'll, they'll have a strong presence and thought on this, but I anticipate this winding down by the end of this year. Um, but I'm going to be here as long as the need is here. And I hope that our, we've demonstrated that. And that we can not only just accommodate, but we can raise everybody's game as an example. So there's a timeline that winds down by the end of the year, but as I mentioned, there's, there's more still trying to find their way to freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from here, um, we'll take questions for uh, the, other, the other group. You can, do, you can do one of two ways. Just raise your hand, I'll, I'll call to you. For those that don't know you, because obviously they're, they're not uh, from, not everyone is, is from the area, if you could just uh, state your name, affiliate that you're, uh, that you're with. Either you can just throw out your question and we'll try to direct it to the appropriate, or if you have a specific question for one of the individuals you heard from, just identify who you're directing the question at. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right there. So timeline is probably most appropriate for Department of Homeland Security since they're the lead feral, lead feral agency, but I'll defer to Aaron. Thank you, Colonel O'Donnell, and uh, thank you for the question. And it's one that we were, I think, asked probably uh, on September 1st, and uh, we continue to adjust. And I would say that the mission really never ends, as you heard Cole uh, say. Uh, there are transition points and points in which, you know, we, we pass the baton. Um, there is a prioritization uh, as far as um, uh, closing the bases and focusing on uh, resettlement. Um, Fort Lee uh, recently, um, you know, closed, uh, so now say seven safe havens. Uh, we are targeted for the end of uh, this calendar year. However, um, you know, understanding that it is also during a holiday season, um, you know, I would anticipate it being first of the year. Uh, but that is our timeline and uh, our objective here at Camp Atterbury. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, the numbers indeed have been increasing, uh, people coming off bases, not just Atterbury, but, but the other uh, seven as well. Uh, in fact, we are receiving about 53 people just this holiday week, which is uh, quite a number in, in, in three business days, essentially. Um, in terms of uh, the holiday week, uh, we are going to keep them fed and their bellies full. We, we have cleaned out every halal market we could find. Uh, in the area. Uh, in terms of, of celebrating the customs of Thanksgiving, I, we have a number of things we're going to be uh, bombarding them with in terms of employment and school and everything. I don't know if we'll get to Thanksgiving this year, uh, but in my experience, uh, holidays in America do indeed need to be explained, especially if someone arrives, let's say, October 31st. There's a lot of cultural things that we need to make sure our refugee and Afghan guests know about the 30-foot the skeleton that their neighbor has up. So, uh, but thank you for that question, and, and uh, we, uh, we are doing everything we can to help them feel welcome at this time. 
Colonel Don, if you don't mind, I want to yes, go ahead. Yeah, jump on that. So, um, I think that's an important topic uh, in which, uh, as a part of uh, cultural awareness training that we do provide here uh, on base, we actually uh, cover uh, Thanksgiving. We also have a turkey chase uh, scheduled on uh, Wednesday and a turkey run um, also uh, with both uh, our uh, Army and uh, DOD partners along with uh, our guests. So we are uh, beginning to acclimate and um, you know, uh, share with them uh, our culture. Thanks. I also saw a few turkeys drawn. I'm going to go there, and then I'll come over to this side of the room. A question for Fred, if you could walk us through um, what it's like to talk to our new guests, assess what their skill sets are, and how you plug them in to the workforce at a time when, frankly, I imagine there's a lot of employers that are just crying out for somebody to come in and help build Sure. Thanks for that question. So one of the things that we're trying to make sure that we're doing is getting a proper assessment of each individual who comes in. So first, when they come into the facility, there's an orientation. And then they are transitioned to what areas they need to be transitioned to. Some is the adult education area. Others are transitioned to job skills and job matching areas where there's an interpreter asking them about their work history and the things that they desire to do. And once they have that information, we assist you know, with the resettlement agencies and provide that info to them. So that's part and parcel where some of the, the initial hard work uh, is. And then in terms of the employers, employers have reached out to us through a variety of means uh, to let us know that they have jobs available, particularly in the communities that we know that the individuals may be resettling, resettling to. So we make sure that we have kind of a robust environment for them in terms of do they have jobs, and we make sure that we're in close contact with the resettlement agencies. And the resettlement agencies are the ones who have, quite frankly, who have the experience uh, in this because that's exactly what they do to make sure that the community itself uh, is available and wants to uh, receive the people and have all the things necessary to receive a family or an individual. So what types of jobs are we talking about? Understanding that some of these folks came here and they were already electricians and sure. skilled, but down the other end, parts of Indiana workforce need, for instance, service personnel. So what types of jobs sure. and references of referrals are we making? Sure. We've had reach out from practically every industry, uh, manufacturing industry, healthcare industry, so there's not one particular industry uh, that we're focused on. It's those employers that have reached out to us, and they cross a variety of industries. Uh, I have two questions We heard from the governor and other officials a couple months back before the refugees arrived, that the goal was to get everybody in and out within about this time. Obviously, the timeline is getting pushed back. I'm just curious if you hear more about what's going to push that timeline. So just so I understood you right, you were, you were asking about uh, the timeline and why uh, pushed uh, in one direction, yeah. So I think as you heard from uh, the resettlement agencies, uh, what was resettled last year was an all-time low uh, across the United States, and you know that had to do with um, both policy but also COVID, uh, and so their resources had been depleted. Um, I think uh, you know here um, as a part of our operation, uh, we also had put a pause on uh, because there was an initial uh, measles um, scare, uh, both at the uh, Oconus locations and a few of the locations um, here within uh, the United States. Uh, uh, thankfully, here at Camp Atterbury, we had zero uh, measles exposure or measles uh, cases. Um, but, you know, a multitude of those uh, type of things and scaling up their resources to be able to resettle everyone um, is what, you know, really has us on uh, track for uh, still targeting the end of the calendar year. But um, you also want to um, maintain... Um, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, room just knowing that the holidays and travel, uh, you know, season uh, being what it is, uh, that we might uh, go into that first uh, of the calendar year. Was there a second follow on question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, we are not expecting any more um, resettling uh, here. We did have uh, an individual whom which uh, had been separated from his family uh, that we reunited yesterday uh, with his family here on base so they could be resettling together. Uh, but as far as, um, you know, any others um, that might be uh, outside the United States to Camp Atterbury, we are not expecting that. Yeah, great questions, and um, you know, I think you heard some numbers. Uh, the key numbers I would, you know, point out to you uh, is about at the end of this week, 50% of our guests uh, here at Camp Atterbury uh, will have resettled. Um, here in Indiana, you'd heard the ambassador talk about doubling uh, what the original commitment was. Um, the commitment uh, today through the resettlement agencies specific for Operation Allies Welcome is 719. Um, as of uh, today, we're uh, at about 250 uh, of that number. Um, as far as locations, uh, that includes Muncie, uh, Bloomington, Hammond, um, Indianapolis, of course, uh, of course, South Bend, Fort Wayne, um, even um, you know Terre Haute, and potentially even Evansville. So um, there are some. Um, typically, there are specific uh, geographical locations uh, that you know um, you can't be within 100, be further than 150 miles from your resettlement agency. As a part of this operation and understanding the challenges associated with that, that has been waived uh, by the federal government, and so that has allowed us to be able to explore um, and really. Um, you know, help uh, those communities that want to uh, resettle uh, our evacuees. Cole, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I'll add uh, briefly, and I think you were starting to touch on it, but uh, most of resettlement for refugees in general and Afghans more specifically first takes a look at U.S. geographic ties, as we call them, friends, uncles, cousins. Uh, so that's primarily the draw, especially in the cases of Muncie, Columbus, uh, uh, even a couple in Bloomington. So those are the key cities, but largely that's where people are going. And then after the State Department and others have assessed uh, the geographic ties throughout the network, we'll look at free cases and where they can go, those that don't have any ties and who has capacity to do it. For example, most of the state of California no longer has capacity because it's, uh, there's a lot of Afghan populations already existing there and they have been the primary destinations, both California and a few cities in, in Texas and the East Coast. Uh, so other cities may, have, may take on some more uh, spreading out the, uh, the resettlement of, of other free cases uh, across the 50 to 49 states that do this work. Thank you. you I'm asking for Nikki. Good. Yeah, go ahead. No. No. Please. Sorry. I said I'm saying I'll get you next. I'm located in Bloomington. I was wondering if I guess we could get the, the spelling of your name and maybe what interested you about uh, how you Bloomington, what you'd like to study there. The reason that I study there, I'm going to study there. Yeah, why, why, why would you like to go to Bloomington? What would you like to study? Uh, actually, uh, right now I'm the PhD scholar at the Elanga University in Indonesia. But you know that to, in order to be a professor in the Bloomington University, I'm going to take the second my master degree in this university. And uh, in this university, I, sorry, I use of the mosque. Uh, you know that uh, in this university, there are some of the professors that I really appreciate them because you know that most of the time I, I have a contact with them and that this kind of the professor, they revive the hope in us, you know, that sometimes they give a hope, you know, that being in camp is not easy, you know, that living and being in camp is not easy, but this kind of the people revive the hope in us. In this case, I would like to study in the Bloomington University because I'm sure that, you know, that I can, uh, all my dream come true. You know, that United States is a land of the opportunity, and I would like to study in United States. Thank you so much. Question about cities. I'm from WDRB in Louisville. What about southern Indiana cities? Jeffersonville, New Albany, any settlement, resettlement there? 
Yeah, um, so I have actually been focused more on the Indiana uh, because of uh, my territory uh, here. Um, our guests, uh, you know, 7,200 mentioned, um, you know, a, a fraction are going to Indiana. There are many others going all across uh, the United States, um, and the other safe havens are also uh, bringing people in here to the United States. Um, and so, yes, uh, at those locations, uh, those are also uh, potential destination points. I don't have the exact numbers on how many have been resettled to those locations, but we can definitely uh, follow up with that uh, with you as well. Yeah, and, and you probably heard me mention uh, that there's a prioritization across the different uh, military um, safe havens, and so um, you know we are averaging um, and need to average a little over 600 uh, to meet our timeline and our objective. Um, this past week, I think we were at 723. Um, you know, the next week forward, um, you know, we're going to be hitting uh, that number again. Um, but again, the, the reason for um, wanting to, uh, you know, look at that early uh, January time frame is just the unknown with uh, weather uh, and, um, you know, um, other potentials. And, and the reason I'm very cautious with that is because our guests, uh, some, uh, whether they've been here since 6th of September, 1st of September, um, it's important that uh, when they hear this and see that, um, that they, um, you know, um, have confidence uh, in that. And so I don't want to uh, give any miss hope uh, for those last few that might uh, be here for uh, early January. Thanks. That's a, that's a really good question. So we, uh, in general, at Exodus, and I know some of the other agencies operate the same way, we'll spend a lot of time with employers, prepping them on cultural norms, helping them translate the, the instructions next to the time clock, uh, working uh, to talk about different documents, uh, what employment authorization documents are accepted, and different things like that. So a lot of prep with the, with the local employers that we work with who are overwhelmingly, as has been mentioned several times, overwhelmingly supportive and, and eager to employ Afghans and other refugee groups. Um, also at the local level, we, we definitely have uh, a number of partners, whether that's uh, members of the faith community or volunteers or local staffing agencies uh, or even the mayor's office in Indianapolis. And I know the mayor of, of uh, some of the other cities we work in have been quite supportive as well. Just whatever resources they need, what other connections we need to help make life and make that transition as easy as possible for refugees. Yeah, so for the people we work with, mostly in the Marion County, but also including uh, uh, Plainfield and a couple of the surrounding uh, areas uh, around Marion County, uh, most of our jobs are pick and pack jobs, warehouse jobs, uh, especially ramping up here at the end of the holiday season or going into the holiday season. So uh, the Amazons, Walmarts, um, very, very open to hiring and, and paying very good wages nowadays to, to help bring our, our refugees and Afghan folks in. Thanks. And question four, Please. Answer one, are you finding, speaking of you know, warehouse type jobs in those locations, Folks in existing communities, even if they're not from Afghanistan, they were able to place some of our guests there, or are there any parts in Indiana where the guests would like to go, but there just isn't the infrastructure or the interest at the local level of bringing them in there? Yeah, so two parts to that. Uh, one, I would say, is the infrastructure is actually very, very important, and, and the key reason why most resettlement happens in, in urban communities. So you need None of them have cars yet, so uh, you need good infrastructure for public transportation to get to and from the grocery store or from a job or to daycare. Uh, you'll need good good healthcare systems, such as we have in, in several cities in, in Indiana, where 
people who may not have had access to specialists or uh, you know all of the the experts at IU Health and Eskenazi, for example, that can help treat diseases that have gone untreated, perhaps, uh, especially for refugees who may have been living in refugee camps for an extended time. Um, so uh, not just that, but also the we're trying, we try our best at Exodus, and I know my, my colleagues do as well. We're, we're teaching them about America, but we don't want them to lose their former culture, their, or their, their culture, the nation that they're leaving as well. The language, the, the food, the vibrant things that they, that they have from Burma, from Afghanistan, from Congo. We want to share in that. We want that to be part of the fabric of, of their new community, and we don't want them to lose it. So uh, it's important then in that case that we house people together in groups that they're able to visit with their friends uh, from, from the same community and speak in their language and have you know, people from their village or from Atterbury that they live with that they can connect with still. I think I watched my first uh, cricket game uh, about two weeks ago uh, with uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. One more. I was going to say one other question. Sure. Uh, I was just going to say, I know you mentioned long term, your basic form is about long term. What does long term mean? Is that six months? Is that a year? Is that five years? Is that 10 years? How long can you stay and make sure to help um, at least It really depends on, on each individual or each family's needs. So if someone, uh, I was just alluding to, if someone has an ongoing medical concern, uh, we may stay with them for a while to help navigate. Uh, a medical system that's unknown to them, for example. So that could take a year, it could take several years. Um, also, family situations may change. So if we've set someone up for success now, maybe that changes a couple years later, depending on many factors, the economy. They can come back to us, we can help them find a new job, we can help get them back into English classes. So. Uh, I'd say it, it varies widely, the people that are ready to go who speak fluent English and will get their PhD very soon to those who maybe uh, have limited English ability and uh, have grown up in a refugee camp, uh, let's say, and, and need a little bit extra guidance. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. I want to mention something with timeline that made me think about it from a prioritization. You know, our first and foremost uh, prioritization is actually medically fragile. Um, and. Uh, there is definitely uh, identifying those individuals who are medically fragile and that are on safe havens. Um, you know, that could be someone who's maybe in their third trimester uh, of pregnancy. Um, we have had 30 uh, births, uh, you know, here uh, of individuals that have been on base already. And so we want to make sure uh, they get uh, prioritized uh, you know, with the resettlement process. Um, and so uh, that also fits into that timeline. Thank you. I have time for one more question.